after a gunman shot and killed 19 children and two teachers at the Robb Elementary School last year in Uvalde, Texas. Serious questions were raised about what police did and did not do in the hour and 14 minutes before they ultimately stopped that shooter. That delay in response is the focus of a new documentary from Frontline. We got to get in there. We got to get in there and just keep shooting. In the immediate aftermath, it was clear that something had gone terribly wrong. Chain of command is everything, and it was not there. None of us have never been in this type of situation. Inside the Uvalde response uses real-time first-hand accounts and official body cam footage and audio to reconstruct the timeline of the shooting and its response, featuring witnesses and survivors to tell the story and highlight the lingering trauma that the town still faces. The film is in collaboration with ProPublica and the Texas Tribune. I'm joined now by Luemi Creel, who you saw in that clip there, a reporter with ProPublica and the Texas Tribune's investigative initiative. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So I, I know as a, a journalist as well, being right there reporting, being in the midst of, of such a terrible tragedy is its own struggle in and of itself, let alone thinking about documenting it. Talk to me about your experience there. So I've been reporting on Uvalde along with a team of, of others at ProPublica and the Texas Tribune basically since it happened. We, during the course of that reporting, obtained a significant amount of investigative material that had not been released to the public. We did several stories on that, but this latest collaboration with Frontline is really the result of the year spending this together, spending putting this together in addition to what we did, you know, last year. So it's been, it's been very, very difficult. Uh, we've also obviously spent time in Uvalde, spoken with families students, teachers, uh, try to speak with police officers. And I think it all just is just really sad and infuriating. Well, you mentioned infuriating in your years of reporting. I mean, when you're thinking about this response to this shooting at an elementary school, was there anything that immediately, you know, sort of stood out to you as you were reporting it uh, during the shooting, after the shooting, or and during the time of putting together this uh, this piece in the investigation? So one of the things that we found um, in this most recent round of reporting, which really spanned all this year, was this incredible contrast between teachers and students are taught to remain quiet during active shooter drills, that that is their best defense to keep them safe. And that's exactly what they did. That's what the teachers and students told not only us, but investigators themselves. And by in contrast, we hear from the officers telling investigators that because that school wing was so quiet, they didn't think that there were children or teachers inside. So it's really this very disturbing contrast between the training that was followed by the students and teachers actually meant that officers were not able or did not realize that there were children inside and so did not respond faster. I mean, it is remarkable. In fact, we have a clip of officers explaining how quiet it was in the hallway and why they thought that there was no one down there. I honestly didn't think anybody was in there mm -hmm. besides the gunman. I didn't hear any screaming, any yelling. Mm -hmm. I literally didn't hear anything at mm -hmm. all, you know, you know, and, you know, you would think those, you know, kids would be yelling and screaming. We couldn't hear the kids. We couldn't hear him shooting anybody or anything like that. Um, so I guess that's why, we, you know, they were waiting to make entry because we didn't know what was going on in there. It was, it was too quiet. Did you think there was kids in that room? There, I knew there was a possibility because of school, but I didn't know for sure that there was kids in there. I was like, yeah, maybe they're doing something else, you know, not in their classrooms. But that was that was kind of a wishful thinking. And I'm also thoughtful of how remarkable this is because active shooter training it was not a new concept. Uh, before this Uvalde shooting, and so as you mentioned, the, it seems like the staff and and. By extension, the children were doing what they were taught to do, but somehow the police officers had this disconnect. Yeah, exactly. So what we also found in our reporting, which included going to active shooter training ourselves and, um, you know, reviewing past uh, 
botched or failed responses like Pulse or Parkland was that a lot of the issues that Uvalde are, are have happened before um, in the terms of police thinking that it was a barricaded shooter, not an active shooter, in the sense of no one going immediately inside once they know that someone is hurt or possibly dying, which is literally the central tenet of their training, stop the killing, stop the dying. Um, and the, the lack of incident command, not knowing who was in charge, the problems with communication, all of these things have happened to some degree before. But I think what happened in Uvalde is not only that all of them coagulated at once, but also, and this is very important, we have access now to not only the body camera footage that shows it in real time, but the interviews with law enforcement telling us how they thought it transpired, which is incredibly rare. Um, there's, you know, this is rare in sort of a normal criminal investigation to get the complete file, but it is in particularly rare in a mass shooting where that information is often kept secret for years if it's ever released. Well, yeah, take us behind the curtain a little bit with this. How did you get access to these investigative materials? So you know that we have sued the ProPublica and the Texas Tribune, and along with a consortium of news organizations, have sued the, the state um, to try to get access to just basic information, so that, like 911 calls that typically would be released in any kind of uh, criminal investigation and a mass shooting. And that has, you know, all of those requests have been denied because there's an ongoing criminal investigation as well into this response. So during the course of our reporting, um, we just, you know, through through a confidential source, were able to obtain a fairly significant amount of terror material from from the investigative files. So that includes more than 150 interviews with law enforcement officers, student teachers, photographs, 911 calls, radio calls, dispatch communications, and together we went through that with with Frontline um, as well, and sort of put together the key moments that we could decipher for this response. When in, you had mentioned that you, the team, have been reporting on this for a while now. When you bring this information back to the community, I mean, or the families, right, like who see this, who are learning this as well, what has been their response and how do you manage that with them? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, obviously the community, Uvalde is, uh, for your what, viewers who may not know, it's a, it's a small city of about 15,000 people in kind of southwest Texas. Um, about more than an hour from San Antonio, this community has just been devastated, obviously, by by what happened. Everybody there, it's a small small city. Everyone knows each other. They see each other. There's one HEV, one main grocery store. Everybody goes to that grocery store. Um, so it's just been incredibly devastating for them. They also just had one homicide the year before this happened. So this is not a community that is used to this kind of tragedy or violence in this way. So obviously it, it, the reporting was very difficult, but what we try to do along with, with the, the team that I reported with is, you know, really talk to people and every child and that is named in the story, we've spoken with their parents, we've gotten consent to use their name, to identify them, to use any identifying footage or audio from them. Um, the families overall, want more accountability and they want more transparency. They want answers. They want to understand what happened that day. They feel that more than 18 months in, they still have very little idea. And so I think that they're grateful to get some answers from us, from this material that we've obtained, but they're still waiting for the official findings from investigators and from the district attorney herself. And so many of them have actually become activists in this space uh, as well. That's right. A lot of them have become um, pretty active when it comes to gun control or things like, you know, lowering the age for, um, or I'm sorry, raising the age for semi-automatic purchases. And then some of them have just retreated because they are just devastated by grief. So I think that's also something that we see that happens after there's community, after these things happen is you have these kind of polar opposite responses and it's just all very sad. Everybody deals with grief differently. And it's sort of an unimaginable grief that I don't think anyone can understand unless you've been through that.
And all through this, uh, you know, as someone who, you know, as we sit in Boston, we watching it from the outside and seeing folks, you know, sort of pointing fingers at each other. And it seems like there was no real resolution or the resolution is ongoing in terms of the chain of command for the police department, the chain of command in state and local government. Is that sort of um, work on that level still being happened to try to figure out who's accountable or do you get a sense that the higher ups in this space are trying to move on from this? I think it's a mixed bag. Obviously, we're still waiting for the findings from from the investigators to be released at all, um, and for whatever the district attorney is going to do with her criminal probe. I think within Uvalde, there has been sort of a divide between families that want to, you know, the community that wants to move on, and and try to, you know, not necessarily forget, but move on to other things, and and the rest of the community that really feels that we can't move on until we have answers and and just are you know devastated angry infuriated wanting some accountability you know we know that very few people have actually been publicly disciplined uh, for their role in the response there were more than 300 state local and federal agents that responded this day and only about you know about five or less than a handful have been publicly terminated others have been reassigned or or retired, but but not a significant number. And so I think that the quest for answers is still ongoing and the quest for just even an acknowledgement of failure more broadly than what has occurred so far. So often we just move on from these stories once they fall out of the news cycle and you and the, and the, the folks on the team there have stayed. Is there anything that sort of stays with you in this reporting as you you continue to be immersed in, in what is a trauma on the entire community? I mean, there's so many, so many moments of this. I, this is a story I'll never forget. Um, I don't think you can when, you know, 10 year olds were, were killed. I think that what really stands out in the documentary and, and I think as well in the story is just so many moments that should have prompted officers to respond differently. But also in the context of, as we spoke, Columbine happened, mm. you know, more than two decades ago, and it still seems like these failures are repeating themselves. And it feels like as a community, as a, as a nation, that we're not addressing the issues that we need to. And whether you think that's gun control or training or, or school hardening, it seems that it's none of it is, is working because some of those failures keep happening. And it's always devastating every single time. Uh, Loemi Creel, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your time.